I'm, I'm Bill Lindley. I, I apologize for my voice. I had uh, the cold that was going around, and I was doing, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor at uh, Mesa Community College, so uh, I was doing a whole lot of talking at the time, but uh, the doctor said I should be fine in a little bit. Um, so again, apologies for the voice. So I started out um, a, a few days ago um, with computers when, uh, before the TRS-80, um, and uh, got, a fir got my first computer job when I was uh, uh, 15. And uh, I think if the folks that uh, were using that accounting software knew that it was maintained by 15-year-old junior programmers, they might have had a second thought. But fortunately, it all worked out. And uh, the world did not, you know, the accounting world did not come to an end. Um, I've brought a bunch of pieces and parts from some of my dad's travels and some of my travels. Uh, those of you who have been in the Linux users group here for a while, um, I met some of you Hans uh, back in, what, 97? Um, somewhere along in there. Um, I still had an 8-bit computer at that time. I brought it to the plug meeting. And somewhere in all the jostling, you know, the CRT went bluey. So that was kind of the end of the 8-bit world. So we do have a continuum. Um, let's see. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go way back uh, to start with. Um, does anyone know who the uh, gentleman was who designed the first digital, not electronic, but mechanical digital computer? Uh, in about what year? Uh, 1700s? In the 1820s. It was Charles Babbage. Yep. And he, he created something called the analytical engine. He was working on a differential engine, which would have been a, basically a programmable digital computer, all mechanical. Okay? And one of the folks who was helping him was Lord Byron's daughter. Does anyone know her name? There's a computer language name for her, Joseph. Ada Lovelace. Ada. 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 For, the Ada, for the Ada language which is a really horrible, weird, strange language. But, uh, but Ada Lovelace, so Ada, you know, Babbage, he was, uh, he was interested in science, he was interested in mathematics, and he was interested in accounting. Because he know that who is the people that have the money? Well, the accountants, of course. So he was going after royal funds uh, to raise money for this machine that would help with accounting as well as science and mathematics and all these. Now, that would be a benefit. But Ada Lovelace, who was helping him, and she actually wrote what some would say to be as the first computer program or algorithm, um, which was kind of a, basically a sort of a mechanical program. Do this until that, and then do this, and then go back to here. So she is regarded by some to be the first programmer. But she also had this little insight, and, and this is a fun thing I tell my students. Not only was the first programmer a woman, but the first person that imagined that computers could do more than just calculate numbers was a woman. That was Ada. And she said, you realize, Mr. Babbage, that your machine could not only calculate sign tables and uh, division tables and keep track of accounting numbers, it could play music because you can reduce music to numbers. And so everything else that we imagine about computers in the real world stems from that insight, that you can do more with a computer than just represent numbers. You can represent the world. So uh, now we're going to fast forward just a little bit to the 1830s. Um, there was a painter who was relatively famous. He did a portrait of uh, George Washington. Uh, you can see some of the other portraits in the National Gallery in DC. I'm not sure whether we have one here at the Art Museum. But he was a painter, pretty famous painter. He got a letter one day that says, your wife is ill, very ill. You'd better come down here. But he was in Washington, DC, I believe, painting a picture. And his wife was in Ohio. And it took days and days for the letter to get there. 
So just about, he, he begins to make preparations to go home to see his wife. While he was doing that, another letter comes. It says, your wife has died. So he gathers up all his stuff and off he goes to Ohio. By the time he gets there, his wife has already been buried. And because of this, because of all the people he knew in DC and all these scientists and everyone, he said, there's got to be a way to send messages with, this, with Mr. Ben Franklin's newfangled electricity. And do you know who that gentleman was, who that painter was? It was Samuel F.B. Morse. And what did he invent? Well, we've, yeah, so do you, we, do you know what that's, what, what is this called? It's a telegraph what? Key. 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 Oh, right. So that, that's Morse code. You know, there are two varieties of Morse code. There's American Morse and there's international Morse. What you hear on the radio, if you ever tune across shortwave, da 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 da, is uh, that's international. That's because it's radio. When you press down the key, it goes for as long as you hold down the key. And when you let go, it stops. Now, with American Morse, there's what's called a sounder. So you're going to have a solenoid. And when you press down the key, it goes click. And when you let go of the key at the other end, it goes clack. So what you hear at the other end is kick, click, clack. So with international Morse, you're hearing basically, if the signal is X, you're hearing X. And for those of you who have taken uh, cal uh, calculus and algebra, if you hear click, clack, that is what? So that's the differential, or DX. That's the differential of the signal. So your mind has to reintegrate the signal. So now in the 1850s, we have telegraphs. And they start stringing the wires across the country and across the West out through here, which begins to replace Wells Fargo, you know, the, the, the uh, Pony Express and all those things. And we have all these wires, OK? So what's the next thing that gets invented that uses those wires in a little bit different way? Microphone. Well, the, yes, the microphone used in what invention? The telephone. Invented by? Bell. Alexander Graham Bell. Well, actually, somebody else invented it about 10 years before, but they, did, but they, did, they, they, they did not patent it. So Bell gets the credit. Um, anyhow, so now you have these, these, these wires that are being used for telegraph and telephone. Now, there's a little bit of difference. We're going to, you know, all, all, all this stuff stems from this, but there's a little bit of difference. Does anyone know the difference? I'm, I'm a ham radio guy, too between a telegraph signal and a telephone signal, electrically. So a, a telegraph signal has how many wires? One. Where's the other wire? Ground. The ground. And in a telephone, you have two wires, because it creates a circuit, a complete circuit. So we have, there were a lot of people who invented all kinds of crazy gadgets to either make it easy to send code, or make it easier to receive code. So people had all kinds of knobs and buttons and solenoids and gears and things that would actually print out a letter. But unless you had a machine at one end very accurately sending at a, at a very fixed frequency, it was difficult to receive at the other end. So those didn't work very well. So we wanted to invent something that made it easy to type and print signals, messages. And what, what kind of a gadget? In fact, the gadget that we're going to talk about next, if you have one of these so-called smart, so-called telephones, which is really a computer, right? It's not a telephone. It does more than just voice. It's a computer because there's a general purpose computer inside, it still knows how to emulate this next gadget. In fact, if, you, if you're on Linux and you press Control-Alt-F1, it goes to a terminal, terminal or a TTY, because the next gadget is a teletype. And how does that work? It takes those very same wires that are strung under the ocean and all across the world, starting in the 1850s, so by the 19-teens, 
when these things started to kind of come about, you've got all the wires. All you have to do is reuse the wires. And the first kind of code was how many bits? Anyone remember? There was a guy named Baudot. Five. Five bits. Now you say, oh, wait a minute. Five bits, that's not enough to represent all the numbers and all the characters. So there was a shift in and shift out code. So by doing that, you get 32 plus 32 minus 2 minus 2. So you get 60 different um, codes out of your out of your five bit code. The other the other gadget, the other gadget we've got. How many people know what this gadget is? Oh come on, it's Lightroom. <laughs> hey, how many people did not know what this is? Okay, see. See, they don't teach these in school anymore. <laughs> okay, now this goes, this goes back, this goes back to our Mr. Babbage because one of the things that he was working on was was a logarithm table. Okay, because in order to multiply two numbers, you can add their logarithms, right? That's for those of you who have taken all that fancy math, right? Um, that that's how this works. Because when you move the slide rule, you're adding two numbers. And what, with this, you're multiplying. Of course, now there were, you know, so this goes back to the 1600s, the slide rule, and Napier and all those folks. Um, a little later on, we come up with circular slide rules, which, you know, work sort of the same way. You put your one number out here, you move your other number in here, and, uh, and you're going to come up with your answer out here. The nifty thing about a circular slide rule is if you go off the top of the scale, you automatically come back around the bottom of the scale. So it makes some of your calculations a little bit easier. Um, th this one right here happens to be my, my grandfather's slide rule. Uh, he graduated the University of Illinois in 1923. So this is ivory. <laughs> um, I guess you can't sell it anymore, or at least you can't take it out of the country. Or if you do, you can't bring it back. Um, but uh, so that's, yeah, well, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, we're going we're gonna to go forward a little bit here. Does anyone remember this company? RCA. RCA. So what, what we have here, um, these are actually unused. So these would be the badges from a 1948 RCA television set. Um, and they're, they're still new, unused in, well, in a plastic bag. Um, but my dad had a whole box of tubes because in the 40s, um, my, my dad was working on this little thing called remote controlled aircraft or drones. And uh, so my, my dad was actually working on drone B-17s and he trained at a little place called Roswell in 1946. And um, so if you wonder what all weird things were going on at Roswell, well, it was things like remote control B-17s. So what these were used for, why would, why would you need, let me ask you this, why would you need a remotely controlled, a drone B-17, Joseph? Target practice. Well, not for target practice. Also for dropping nukes. Well, not for, dro not for dropping nuclear bombs. Yeah. 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 Right, so what, what these drones were used for, my dad was on Operation Crossroads. So if you remember, what was the very first uh, atomic detonation? It was Trinity, Trinity at, in New Mexico, and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the next two were called Abel and Baker, and my dad worked on Abel and Baker. And that's what they used these drone B-17s for was they would fly them through the clouds because they didn't want to send people up there. They would fly them through the clouds to take samples at different altitudes and different times. So he was working on television. He was actually working on television for the Army in 45 and 46. So after he got out, it was a natural that when he went back home and and saw an ad in the paper. It said, we need people that work on this new thing called television. And he went into RCA and he said, well, I have experience. They said, what do you mean you have experience? We haven't invented it yet. 
Well. Can't tell you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he got the job. Um, and he came home, and my, my mom and dad were just married, and she said, what are you going to be? He said, I got the job. What are you doing? He said, I'm working on television. Of course, he hadn't told her what he did during the war. She says, what's television? So that was, that was 47. Um, so from there, he went on to work on, on radar. And uh, of course, radar generates a whole bunch of data. All that data gets fed into what? Well, a computer. So here we have IBM System 360. Um, I thought I had it here somewhere. But um, well, anyhow, you can just imagine. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is, this is the only prop I didn't bring. But what is about, about the same size, OK, and you punch holes in it? Oh, yeah. the Hollerith yeah. card. It's a Hollerith card, or an IBM, or a computer card which was the same size as the old dollar bills. Why is that? Well, that's become, because Mr. Watson with IBM, when he was starting his business, his tab tabulating and computing business, needed a place to store all these cards. So he didn't know what size card to make. And he was walking outside the Mint one day, and they were throwing away all of their old file cabinets for dollar bills. He said, can I have those? And they said, sure, they're scrap. So that's how we got the size of a computer card. Um, which, by the way, those were the first app, OK? Because you could walk around with a computer card, and you could, you could how many of you did those little mark sense bubbles in school? OK. Well, you could do your little mark sense bubbles on the computer card. And how did all these computers work? Remember, these were not electronic computers. All of this data processing was not electronic. What you did was you put all your data onto a punch card, and you had other data on more punch cards, and you fed them into a machine, which had a bunch of relays, and it spat out more cards. So basically, you put a bunch of cards in, you pushed the button, it went <laughs> and you got a bunch of cards out, and then you took them over and put them on a printer, and it printed them. And this was without a computer. Now, it may have had little logic on a relay board, but there was no computer. So when the idea of electronic digital computers came along, IBM said, well, we can take all of our punch card equipment and attach it to these punch, you know, to these new computers. So we can do this. You can have the same input. You can have the girls, which is what they called them, you know, the girls would type the key, you know, would, a key punch operator. They would type this out. And you have the same data flow, except now instead of going to your mechanical computation, it goes to a digital computer. And so what they're doing is they're piggybacking on old technology in exactly the same way as the teletype piggybacked on the Morse code, right, on the telegraph. So what do we see here? Every time there's a new technology, it just piggybacks one onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. Now I had, uh, speaking of electronic digital computers, the first ones were not tube-based, but they were based on relays. And there was one, one of the very first ones of these was at Harvard. And there was a lady at Harvard. And she was a, what they called a, com she was a computer. OK? So the machine said elect the Harvard electronic computer, but the people who tended it were called computers. And the computer had a malfunction one day, and she traced it back to a relay where a moth had gotten under the little shroud of the relay and fouled the relay. And she put it in her logbook. And you can still see the logbook at the Smithsonian. It says, in the logbook, Here's the moth taped down. It says, first known computer bug. <coughs> and do you know who the lady was? Grace, Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper. Right. So I had the opportunity to go hear her speak twice, once at MIT and once at the Pentagon. Um, well, at Crystal City, outside the Pentagon. And uh, 
what a wonderful lady, this was in 1986, both of them. What, what a wonderful lady she was. I mean, she was, um, she was our oldest commi living commissioned officer. Um, and until shortly before she died, uh, at age, I think, 89 or 90, she was still an officer. Um, when I met her, um, they had promoted her to rear, uh, President Reagan had promoted her to rear admiral, but we all still called her Commodore because she was one of the few people to hold the rank of Commodore. In fact, it was kind of pulled out of retirement just for her. But she said two things that I remember. One is, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission, which generally works pretty well. Although these folks up here would beg to differ. Um, but, uh, and one other thing, in, in 1986, <coughs> you know, we've got Watson, we've got all these uh, things that listen to you and answer you in allegedly artificial intelligence, right? Well, in 1986, she said, computers are getting better and better at answering questions. And there's no need to worry until a computer begins asking questions. So when they start asking quest, when they start asking questions, yeah. So anyhow, so now 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 we're up to uh, now we're up to the 1960s, and what um, what's a little bit interesting about the System 360. So this is actually a programmer's reference card. So this tells you in hexadecimal what all of the instructions do. Because in those days, it was just the beginning of doing a program any way other than writing out all of the numbers on a bunch of, just writing all the numbers out on the page. Because going back to Mrs. Hop, Ms. Hopper, while she was at Harvard, remember our, remember our friend Ada. And Ada had the insight, well, you can do more with a computer than just crunch numbers. You can do things. Well, Mrs. Hopper had the insight, why is it so difficult to write a program? Why can't we have a program written out in something that looks like English and have the computer turn it into the numbers that run the program? And you know what the Navy told her? You can't do that. That's because you're a woman. Women don't, you know, women can't program computers. That's a men's job. See. The fact that you even had that idea shows you're a woman. And so after the war, she went to work for this little company called um, Sperry and Univac. Well, it was Univac at first. And then later it was Sperry. And then later she worked for IBM. And she, what, what, what she was doing for them, among other, many other things, was developing the idea of a computer language. So Mrs. Hopper was basically the person that said, we can have a computer language. And that was called, anybody want to guess? Formula Translator. No, a little earlier. Algo. Fortran. No, before that, before that. COBOL. COBOL. Yes. Well, actually, the language COBOL came out, came out of a group called CODASYL, C-O-D-A-S-Y-L, which is the Committee on Digital Anyhow. COBOL was the language to come out of that, which was the Common Business Oriented Language. Because again, Mrs. Hopper knew, if you want to chase money, you don't go after the scientists, they're broke. <laughs> right? When you go after the business people, that's where the money <coughs> is. And that's what, you know, Univac knew this, IBM knew it, Spirit, all those companies knew that the business people, and of course you're going to invent all the scientific stuff. That's the fun stuff. But the business is where the money is. So she invented the concept of a computer language, and she was on the committee that created the first computer language. The second widely used computer language was called Fortran, um, which I have here. This, this is a Fortran program that I wrote. This is one of my first Fortran programs. Um, but if you look at the date code up here, it says uh, 1 December 79. Now, this is off a laser printer. And what do you notice that's different about your typical laser printed output? It's fanfold paper, and what else? What kind of paper is it? This is actually a liquid toner. So most of your laser printers, 
nowadays use a, a, a solid toner, right? It, it's dry. If you open the cartridge, it's pff, dry stuff. That's what, and the Greek word for dry, Paulos? Xero. Xero, from which we get the company name? Xerox. Xerox. Or, as it used to be known, the Haloid International Corporation. But Xerox is much more interesting. But in the early days of laser printing and photocopying, they used a liquid toner because it was easier to make the machine work. And they, hadn't, they had not perfected dry xerography yet. Um, so this was written on a PDP-11, um, which is a, a mini computer. You see, the IBM 360, how big was that? It would, it, it, a whole system would fill this room <laughs> with the CPU and the memory and the disk drives and the tape drives and the air conditioner and the cooling and the, and the, and the place to store the tapes would take up a place about the size of this room. The PDP-11 was a mini computer. It only took up a space the size of this podium. So that was pretty small. Where was the IBM 709? That was before the 360. Right. The, the, the 360, if you look at, if you look at this uh, logo here, the 360 logo is a compass, and a compass rose inside of it. And what that indicates is that it, it does everything. That the 360 is a business machine, it's a scientific machine, it's an all-around machine. And what's also kind of cool about the 360, now the 370 had real virtual machine inside of it, but the 360, the, the early models, actually had a pluggable CPU. So when my dad was working on his thing, he actually was using a 1401. So the 701, the, the machine that was twice as good was the 1401, right? So he actually had a pluggable module that they would shut, you know, each job would run. At the end of each job, they would shut the machine down, pull out the CPU module, plug in a personality module for a different CPU, and run the next job. So that was why the 360 could do that. In the 370, they virtualized it. So, and in some of the later models of the 360, I believe. And, and so basically, IBM had bet the company on that 360 because they were eliminating all of their other machinery, basically. And they were saying, we're going to put all of our eggs in this one basket, and we're going to guard this one basket very carefully. And in fact, how many programs today still run on a 360 architecture? Well, look up in the sky. What do you see? Not, not the satellite. Some of us see, see those. But what's a little bit closer? Airplanes. And your air traffic control, a lot of that still runs on software that was based on 360. So again, virtualization gets plugged on top of, gets plugged on top of, gets plugged on top of. Every time there's new technology, we just plug it on top of each other. If you really want to go way back and talk about mil specs and technology, you know what I mean by mil spec? OK? A military specification. So you know, in, in commerce, we can, we can buy all kinds of stuff down at the 99 cent store. Does the Army buy stuff at the 99 cent store? No. Why not? Why not? Because they can't be guaranteed of the quality. They can't be guaranteed of how precise it is. So there used to be a mill spec. I don't know whether there still is. I don't know whether they still use ashtrays. Um, but there used to be a specification from the US Army, from the Department of Defense, the Department of War, originally, um, about how many pieces could a glass ashtray break into if dropped from a three foot tall desk. And do you know how many pieces it was allowable for a glass ashtray to, drop, to break into? Three. And how did they come up with that number? Do you think they called in a bunch of doctors and scientists and physiologists to say, you know, how sharp are they? No. Do you know how they did it? First, they picked the company that they wanted to win the contract. And then they dropped all of the ashtrays from all of the companies. <laughs> and the one that was from the company that they wanted to win the contract broke into three pieces. So they said, that's the specification. 
And this is how we make pol this is how we write laws. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you if you ever want to if you ever want to see sausage made, you can go down to the Capitol building. Oh, sorry. Um, but do you want to know what? You, yeah. Are you going to explain waivers now? Well, I'll, I'll just go really I'll go really far back for just a moment. One of the oldest uh, piece of design specifications that we still use today. How many of you have heard of a 19-inch rack? Do you still? Yeah, OK. Um, Brian, some of your stuff used to be on a 19-inch rack. OK, so it's 19 inches wide. Why? Why is it 19 inches wide? Why do we build computers? Well, that's because the railroads used them for relay racks. Remember? Telegraph machines always ran next to the railroad lines because that's who owned the property. The relay racks were 19 inches wide. Why? Well, because they had to fit through a door on a railway car. Well, why was the door that width? Well, because you could only make it a certain, I mean, it would be nice to have a wider doorway, right? But the railroad car had to have, have, to, had to have structural integrity, integrity. So why was the railroad car that width? Well, that's because they built it about as wide as they could to fit on the tracks. Well, why were the tracks? How far apart are the railroad tracks? So we're back to the about the same, same width as a Roman chair. Right. Four feet, eight and one half inches. The one half inches comes from the first, from Trevithick, who built a railroad that was four foot eight. But it was a little too narrow. The, they didn't want to redo the wheels. So he just moved the rail down half an inch to make it easy to go around a curve. But why did he build it that way? Well, that's because when he went to the, chair, to the coach builders, that's how wide they made the coaches. In England and France and Germany and Italy and all these places, they made the coaches that way because there were still a lot of Roman roads. And the Roman roads were made out of stone. A few of them concrete, but mostly stone. And they had ruts in them. Well, you say, well, how can a stone road have a rut in it? Well, you drive across it for a few thousand years, and it's going to get ruts in it. Anybody, anybody been to somewhere like the Parthenon? Okay. Really, really, yeah, <laughs> OK, OK. Well, I know you have. Anyone else? OK. So if you look at the stone steps there, they're like this, from people walking up and down for thousands of years. So these ruts in the Roman roads were four feet, eight, eight inches wide, because that's how wide the Roman chariots were for the army. Why? Because that's how wide two horses are if you put the struts on either side of the horse. So basically, a Roman mill spec determined your 19-inch rack. OK, now if you listen to De Beers, they will tell you that a diamond is forever. No, no. But a mill spec, now that's forever. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so we're, we're, we were talking about laser printers, right? How, how much more do I have? Tell you're done. I'm done? No, tell me you're done. No, 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 no. <laughs> so um, we got another printer here. Who, who remembers Office Space? Fun movie, right? Printers? Everybody loves printers, right? No. Well, I love printers. Well, when they work, which isn't very often. But anyhow, this was a laser printer. What kind of printer is this? Does anyone know? Thermal. This is a thermal printer or electrostatic. And so this is paper that's got a, a, a coating of basically metal. Now, some of you have probably seen impact printers that had a ribbon. What kind of, what kind of print head would this have had? So this, so I'm going to, if you have a light source, you can actually hold this up to the light. So if you look through this, well, it's hard to do for the camera, but what it did is it actually had a printhead that went across and burned this metal off the paper. And when it ran, it produced ozone, which, of course, they couldn't make it now because, gosh, ozone, right? Um, but uh, this was a COM print was the name of the printer. And most other matrix printers you've seen, the printhead goes like this. But on the COM print, it went up and down the page like this because the paper, instead of, you know, most printers go deep, zip, Deep, zip, deep, zip, right? It moves up and, well, the comp print was a continuous motion. So the printhead moved back and forth at a continuous speed, and the printhead moved at a diagonal. 
So just when you think there's not other weird ways of doing things, I wish I had one to bring along. One of the first, okay, who knows what this is? Floppy. floppy disk, okay. Um, this, this, this floppy disk in particular belonged to a gentleman that, I did, that my dad and I did some work for in 1980 and 81 by the name of Kerry Liu. Um, some of you, some of your older folks, like me, may remember there used to be something called High Tech Magazine, or High Technology it was originally. And the editor of that was Kerry Liu, and he was also the science editor for a program that I bet a lot of you watched on television. And it was produced by the Children's Television Workshop, Sesame, Sesame Street. So he was the science editor for Sesame Street. Um, and he used a program called Autoscribe for all of his professional writing. He used Autoscribe, which ran on the Heathkit. And that's what uh, my dad and I happened to have. No? OK. Well, I have a couple of badges here from uh, their use, but I have a couple of badges from some of the Heathkit computers that I built. This, w this was the 8-bit, and this was the 16-bit C100. Um, I, I wound up building about 30, maybe 40, maybe 50 of these Heathkits as a summer job, uh, as well as for friends and as well as I sold them. So um, I had a little business um, writing software for the Heathkits because um, my dad and I bought this weird printer called Base2. It didn't work with the Heathkit, so we wrote a driver. And I said, well, why don't we sell it? Because I bet other people have the same thing. And before you know it, you know, we put in, we put in a little uh, letter in a newsletter. And before you know it, people are sending us money. So I was in business. Um, yeah, I, um, Dr. Dobbs. Anyone remember Dr. Dobbs? This was one of the first uh, uh, national computing magazines. Uh, th this happens to be the May of 1980 issue where they talk about C because in that point, uh, up to 1980, some of, some of you had Apples or, or TRS-80s or, or some CPM machines. And what did you program those in? What languages could you use? Well, you could either do assembly and you know, do just like you know, my, my, my dad used to do and hand assemble your code, 3F226093. Or you might write it in BASIC. Because the BASIC interpreter that everybody used was created by what company? IBM. Microsoft. 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 And they got it from where? Well, they got it from a dumpster outside a digital equipment corporation. Well, at least that was the story. Um, if we had our projector. Um, I, I was, in, in 1980, I was in the newspaper in my, this is in Lowell, Mass. I was outside of Boston. Um, but I was, you know, one of these 15-year-old kids with his own software business. Um, so I, I got to go to trade shows, and I don't know how they do it now, but, you know, I was, I was an exhibitor at a trade show when I was 16, you know. So, um, yeah, well, I don't even know if they'd let you in the door because, do you have any identification papers? No, I don't. Um, anyhow, but um, so... You know, where I worked in high school, I did accounting software. Um, I did printer drivers for the 8-bit computers. Um, and, uh, on that mini computer, we had some VT100s. And those of you in Linux, your, your terminal says, what type am I? I'm a VT100. Well, this was, a, this was a VT100. This is what they actually looked like. OK, so big machine. The fun thing about the, uh, the VT100 was that in the back of the machine, in the back of the terminal, this was just a dumb terminal. Well, it was a smart terminal, really. OK, dumb terminal is like an ADM3. But the, the VT100 actually had space in back where you could put up to three cards in it. And later on, you could actually it would actually do vector graphics. It would emulate a Tektronix vector terminal. And you could put a computer in here that would run CPM. So you could actually turn the terminal into a computer. 
as as for Heathkit, there were there were two magazines. Uh, Remark was the one from the Heathkit Users Group, and Sextant was from a private company. And this was the premier issue of Sextant from spring of '82. And you say, well, how did they? You know, what what is a Sextant? Navigation tool. A navigation tool, right? And Charles Flodo, who was the man who ran it, said, well. They asked him, well, how did you come up with the name? Does it have something to do with finding your way in the Heathkit world? He said, no. He said, I knew how they would display it on the newsstand. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look here, on, um, so here's me and my dad on page 37, Lindley Systems, with all of our printer drivers and checkbook software and little accounting package and all that. So, um, I sold a lot of software. What's kind of funny is that um, our, one of our bigger selling products wound up being a print screen program. So in those days, your, your terminal could actually have line drawing graphics on the screen. And then later on, when we got to um, uh, MS-DOS computers, a lot of those had bit graphics. Well, you could have graphics on the screen, but your printer did not have a way to print anything that looked like that. So my dad and I wrote a program that let your printer do bit graphics that looked just like what was on your screen. And how did you do it? Well, in those days when you bought a printer, here's the MX100 from Epson. The MX80 was 8 inches. The M MX100 was, a, was the wide carriage. So in those days, they did something really crazy with manuals. They told you how the machine worked. Here's timing diagrams. Here's a circuit diagram. Here's a list of all the escape codes and all the bits and what they really do. So they actually told you how the printer really worked. So my dad and I used that knowledge to write a program that let you print what was on your screen. And a, a bunch of people bought it. And then all of a sudden, we started getting these phone calls one day. Well, who are all these people? It turns out, back in the days before everybody had these silly little gadgets, people would go to the racetrack. And you want to do handicapping. You want to know, how do I bet the horses? Or how do I bet the dogs, right, at the Greyhound Park? But how do you bet the horses? Well, you want to have all, you feed all of this data into a computer. And remember, before there was the internet, we had modems that would dial into what kind of a thing? That would, where you would talk to other people in your area. A BBS, a bulletin board system. So there were these horse racing people would all dial into bulletin boards that were run by other horse racing people where they could either type in or they could download all of this horse racing data. And they would run their programs and they would put, they would put their special little information and what other people told them and they would come up with their own odds. So when you go to the track, the odds keep changing, right? Because people keep betting, and the odds keep changing. But you've got your list printed out. So the minute that their odds give you better than your odds, you bet on that horse. So what do you want to do? You want to print out what's on your screen, because your screen has all these pretty little charts and all these numbers that are formatted. So we started getting, and that, this came out in the newsletter. I sold about 500 copies of our $20 program to these people that were doing horse race handicapping. Now, that's what's called a vertical market, if I ever heard of one, right? Well, they would say it's a horizontal market, right? Well, it's kind of an oval market. But um, in, in, in those days, a lot of the software was distributed on, on not on floppy disk, but on cassettes. Here's a Heathkit cassette, OK? So this actually has Benton Harbor Basic on it. So in order to run Basic on our Heathkit machine, originally you would turn the machine on, beep beep. You'd type a load. You'd type load, and then you'd make sure the cassette was lined up. Press play, and wait. And then after about five minutes, it would go beep, loader. Then you'd rewind. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, we got to floppy disks. 
Oh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. I'm jumping around just a little bit, but I do want to wrap up shortly. So printers, right? Hewlett Packard used to have this program. If you were a developer, they would send you books that actually told how the printers worked. What a concept. I don't know if anybody still does this. Because you're not supposed to know how your machines work, right? Like all these little gadgets that everybody seems to have, how do they work? Where's the programmer's guide? You're not supposed to be able to write a program. Why would I want a computer I can't write a program for? Well, I don't know. But I can tell you that I worked on, what's this guy doing with his screen? OK. So what this is doing, this was a built, these were building directories that used <coughs> touch screens. This is where I worked in college starting in 1984. So we had, if you look at all this fun stuff, we had a camera. This was our digitizer. This was our scanner. Scanners, flatbed scanners, were unknown. The only way to get an image into a computer was to feed it into a video camera, then take that video signal and turn it into a digitized analog to digital signal. And boy, was it messy. Time consuming. You needed hot lights. Did your projector overheat too? Oh, things were, things were overheating and exploding all the time. These, because we, you know, we had halogen bulbs. And you get a little bit, you get a little bit of moisture. You get a little bit of grease on those. You turn them on about five minutes later, boom! And if you didn't have the little glass shield on there, you got shrapnel everywhere. But, but we actually had a video disc overlay, uh, graphics, interactive, touchscreen system that used an event loop with interrupt. So you, you said you created a bunch of targets, and you said when touched, react; when touched, start. And we, you know, the graphics that we had were about 10 years ahead of what IBM had. In those early days, there was something called Targa. Anybody remember Targa? They sold like $3,000 graphics cards. And in the 80s, $3,000, you could buy an automobile for that. Well, a Yugo, the world's first disposable car. But, uh, but yeah. Um, and, and, and the video discs, we had these 14-inch video discs. Um, you'd talk to it through a serial connection. And, um, but all of this technology was pretty new and was coming out of what we now call the MIT Media Lab. They didn't call it the Media Lab yet. It didn't have a name yet. It was still just the computing center. Um, I got a tour of that place in 1982 and met some weird guy with a big beard. <laughs> RMS. Richard Stallman, among a bunch of other people. And I got to type on one of those Lisp machines, you know, with the Space Cadet keyboards, which is what Emacs, you know, escape, you, you know what Emacs stands for? Escape Meta Control Alt Shift. Oh, no. <laughs> editor macros. Um, and editor macros for what, you might ask? Well, editor macros for a very early editor called Tico, which goes back to 1962 and ran on the PDP-11 and the, and, the and the DEX system 10s. Right, so digital computers. So again, everything builds on top of, keeps building on building. Um, somewhere along in there, we got uh, the IBM personal computer. Uh, 1981, IBM introduced the PC. Um, we got ours a couple years later. This was from, in those days, I was going to the Northeast Computer Show up in Boston. And this was one of the fun things they handed out. A few years later, and I'm pretty much going to segue into the next talk, um, the Heathkit store had a special presentation. I think this was 85. I'm not sure. It's either 84, 85, or 86. Somewhere right along in there of this little gadget that came crawling out like this one and said, I am the Heathkit educational robot. It had an arm. And this is the Hero One, which was the first commercially available um, robot that was designed for education. So um, I, I hope that shows you how we keep you know, building just one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer. And uh, even your newest gadget goes back to the 1800s in the 1600s before that. So 
um, have a lot of fun computing and uh, you know I'm open to questions and and these are up oh oh one more thing does anybody know what this is the tape tape read uh, it's a read only it's, it's a write enable ring so for the for the big computers that use nine track you know these mag tapes you'd put this on the hub of the of the tape to enable writing on the tape if you took it off it was read only so all this stuff is up here to look at I'm happy to answer questions now or later yes sir yeah, you said the uh, punch cards were not electrical the first ones so the the punch cards you you would the first ones were done for the 1890 <coughs> census okay so the census bureau remember all those boring accounting people they were the ones that said we have got we're going to be accumulating too much data because the 1880 census took until 1890 to compute so it wasn't very useful because by the time they were done it was obsolete so they said this can't we can't do this we've got to have a, a mechanical system and Hollerith was the guy that invented uh, a, a mechanically punched card so the census taker instead of writing all this out or that he could write it out, but he would go back, and someone would go punch, 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 and that would be elect that would be mechanically tabulated. So it it all kept building on that. So there is no electrical impulse; it just it no, no. Remember, remember the hanging chad of two thousand. Okay, in Florida, the way that you voted, you put a punch card into a into a slot, and then you went punch, punch, punch. That's all they did, and then. The, the mechanical, there would be a, when, the, when you calculated, you would feed it into a machine, and then you, your card would be here. And depending on where there were holes, you would either block or, you know, little Paul P A W L would go would go out, and, and that was the mechanical system. Right. So, and, and that goes back to, does anyone know the name of the mechanical loom? That was used. Jacquard. Jacquard. Right. So if you go up to like again Lowell, right, where that newspaper was, if you go up to Lowell, there, I don't know if there is now, but the, you, there used to be a museum where you could actually see a Jacquard loom in operation, and these things would have punch cards, which are about this big, and each one of them determines which threads. Okay, so it would advance. The threads would be extended. And then the shuttlecock would go across, and then you know you get the so you you would actually produce a pattern based on the punch card. So that's what Hollerith looked to and said, that's how I'm gonna do this for the calculation. So the pins would actually block <laughs> or release <laughs> a gear. Oh. Which would kick the card one direction or another to sort it. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And now the, the, now the, the Jacquard looms were powered by what? Steam, water. Even before they were powered by steam, that, that was Mr. Newcomen and Mr. Watt's invention of 1804. By what? Water power? Water power. So you have a giant water wheel, which turns a gear, which turns a shaft at a very low speed. But can you imagine the torque? OK. Okay, so basically you have an unstoppable um, rod that's running up and down the length of the mill, and then you attach a leather belt, and then you have a you have a clutch. Okay, so and and a lot of your machines could have been operated either by a treadle, steam power, electric motor, or water power. So you could actually have a water powered computer. Which is why New England is such an industrial center because there are so many waterfall mm -hmm. places all up and go down the East Coast. As well as, yeah, as well as they did not want to export that machinery to the South. But that's a whole other topic. <laughs> oh, and one last thing. Do you remember I mentioned Grace Hopper, right? So when I heard her speak, she gave me this. Well, she gave us all one of these. But do you know what this is? It's a nanosecond. It's a nanosecond. OK, now more than a nanosecond, what, what is this actually from? Uh, yeah, right, it's from a 50-pin telephone cable 
from a key system. Okay? Um, and what this is, this is 11.27 inches long, which is the distance that light travels in one nanosecond. And what Ms. Hopper said was, this is what limits computing. Because you can't go any faster. You can't go faster than light. You can parallel the, parallelize the operation. You can do more of them at the same time. But you cannot propagate a signal. So all of your data that has to come from somewhere and go to somewhere is limited by this nanosecond. <coughs> By the way, if you want a picosecond, it's in the pepper shaker on your table. That's what she said. Yeah, I saw her hold up a microsecond so for those that thought they weren't important. <laughs> so, yeah, I can, th this will be up here as well. So this is, this is from Mrs. Hopper. Thank you. <laughs>